How's it going, fellow crafters? So I finished my modular fungal forest with its bioluminescence. And I have to say, it didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to, but I'm glad that it didn't. Let's get into it. Before I get into all the painting techniques I used for this, I did mention in the first episode of this series that I'd be testing glow-in-the-dark paint. So I went out and I bought Deco Arts glow-in-the-dark paint, and to run a simple test, I primed the bottle with plenty of light. I took a character sheet, took those both in a pitch black room, and slowly introduced light to where I could see the character sheet and read it. Now, well before the point to where I could see a single letter on the character sheet, the glow-in-the-dark paint was overpowered by the light. So at least with the deco art paint, it's not really applicable for D&D. So as far as the techniques I used, I tried a lot of different ones, and a lot of them failed. I tried dry brushing, I tried making a wash that was bright and pearlescent, and that kind of worked, but it wasn't quite satisfactory. So it came pretty apparent that my only option would be wet blending. And this was the first time I've ever wet blended, and it was a partial success. I could do it on two of the species, but when it came to the toadstools and the morel mushrooms, I couldn't really get it to where I wanted it. So if I was only a crafter and not a DM, I didn't have to worry about scheduled games coming up. I would keep working, building on my failures, and get my wet blending to where I wanted it to be. But I think this is an important lesson as crafting DMs. Uh, sometimes you don't have time to do that, so you need to be able to adapt and pivot your project so you can finish it in time. So to do this, I went back to my mind's eye and reimagined my Underdark. So through going out of my comfort zone and failing, I learned to flex some creative muscles and be able to pivot by changing my descriptions. I identified some techniques that I want to pursue and perfect, and my net result is some terrain that isn't quite what I intended it to be but it still looks good and it's functional, and imperfect terrain is better than no terrain. So with that all being said, let's head over to the desk and I'll show you how I painted all these. For all the bases, I started with chipboard. For the two worms and the morel mushrooms, it's pretty simple, just the chipboard with some rocks to add some detail. However, when it comes to the toadstools, because they're gonna have minis on the top in gameplay, we need to have a lot of weight on the bottom, so I'm gonna include a couple additional steps to do so. Because I'm going to be using joint compound, it's important to seal the chipboard so the moisture doesn't warp it. To do so, I used Mod Podge. It's best not to wet the brush, and don't forget to do the bottom. For the bases that would be connected to the large mushrooms, I added some washers to increase the weight. Then I added these aquarium rocks from Dollar Tree for extra weight and for aesthetic purposes. When applying the joint compound, I'm going to leave the top of these rocks exposed. To give some added strength to the joint compound, I added Mod Podge. To apply it, I got messy and used my fingers. I think it's the easiest way to apply it. You can wipe off the excess from the top of the rocks so it exposes their texture. I made sure it carried over the edge. If there's any excess, I could just break it off after it dried. The joint compound's a bit hard to shape, but with some effort, you can make it into passable stone. Milliput or sculpt a mold or something else would probably be easier, but it's what I had on hand, and for me, it was the cheapest way to add some extra weight on the bottom. Once the joint compound had dried, the chipboard was still flat, but the joint compound did crack, which I was actually hoping for, so it looks like the mushrooms are breaking through the earth. To 
attach the mushrooms to the joint compound, I used my favorite method for a strong bond, super glue and baking soda. I just used a little bit of water so the baking soda would attach to the mushroom, apply the super glue to the base, and lock the two together. I also went in and reinforced with more super glue and baking soda. The mushrooms look good when they're at a slight angle, but keep the gameplay in mind because you don't want many sliding off. Just add some smaller rocks on top with some super glue and you're done with basing. I coated all the fungi in a mixture of gray paint and Mod Podge. For the toadstools, I base coated them in Calypso Blue, Magenta, and Linen. You'll notice in the video that the stems are painted Calypso Blue, but that was only because I was still testing different techniques. You'd want to go straight in with the linen. Once the Calypso Blue was dry on the top, I went in with a very conservative amount of Magenta. I then brushed it around unevenly, and this gave it a really cool color shifting look. The camera doesn't pick it up very well, so it's something you just gotta play with on your own. And to create some variance between the different mushrooms, I used different amounts of magenta. I then went in with a liberal dry brush of Royal Fuchsia, and if I was smarter, I would have waited to paint the bumps on the top, so I wouldn't have to navigate around the bumps. A small flat brush and a fine tip brush are your best friends for this. To downplay the cartoonish look, I went in with a brown wash. This makes it look more natural and grimy, fitting for the underdark. I didn't like the way the wash was pooling on the sides of the stem, so I went in with the side of my brush and wicked off the excess. Once the mushrooms have dried, I went in with the same colors as my cavern tiles to paint the bases. And with that, the toadstools are done. When it came to the tube worms, I wanted the shells to look like they were made out of the cavern. So to do so, I picked the lighter shade of my cavern tiles and added different amounts of the darker gray and a tannish color. And you see that a lot in nature, where individuals of a species have slight differences. I found that four different variations was plenty of diversity between the shells. And here are the shells base coated in those different shades. bring out all that texturing I made with a hot glue gun, I went in with suede and dry brushed them all. If you haven't bought a makeup brush for dry brushing, you're gonna wanna go out and get one. You can get them for a buck at Dollar Tree and they really are awesome for dry brushing. I dry brushed the rocks on the chipboard base, but then I stippled the actual chipboard. I didn't wanna highlight the edges by dry brushing. To prep the plastic petals for painting, some unintentional alliteration there. Wash them in soapy water and then spray paint them with gray. And you can see I made some cuts into some foam to make them more accessible for painting. To keep the bioluminescent effect consistent, I used the same three colors in all applications. I based it with Pantina and then for the brighter shade I went with Spa Blue and then a Pure White for the brightest shade. And here in the middle you can see a finished plume. It's been wet blended so it has this gradual gradient getting brighter towards the top. When wet blending you need to work with wet paint so you gotta be kind of fast with this. I did about five plumes at a time working on one side. I applied the Pantina at the bottom portion. Then with about over half of the plume I did Spa Blue. And then at the very tip I went in with the Pure White. To blend the colors together, you rinse out your brush
get the appropriate amount of water, and then do a bit of back and forth motion until you see the gradient show up. It takes practice to get it down, and it's imperative that you have the right amount of water. Mylock has an excellent video where he does lava using this technique, and he does a really good job of showing how it's done. To finish the glowing effect, I painted the inside of the tubes with Pantina, and then just with some glue, I attached the plumes. And for a final step, I applied a black wash to the exterior of the tubes, being careful not to get it where it was glowing. I tried adding bioluminescence at the low points in the morel mushrooms, but because of how small they were, it was a little too difficult. So part of my pivot and reimagining of my underdark terrain, I decided to paint these like my violet fungus miniatures. I imagined the violet fungus miniatures evolving to look like these benign mushrooms, but having bioluminescent tendrils that draw in prey, kind of like an anglerfish. So when painting these, I just went in with a dioxazine purple, and then I went in with a lighter purple, hitting the low points as well, and then finished with a magenta, followed by a brown wash. To base coat this species, I did the bottom with a teal, and the top with a turquoise. I then applied the black wash before I added any dry brushing, because I didn't want to dull the bright colors that would be the bioluminescence. Bring out that unique texture from the styrofoam balls. I dry brush with the Pantina, which is the base for my bioluminescence. I then took that same Pantina, watered it down, and applied it to the center of the piece with the idea that it would look like it's glowing from the center. While that was drying, I base coated the caps in pure white. And while the Pantina was still wet, I went in with that spa blue. I was pretty impatient at this point, so I didn't try a lot of wet blending in this stage. And the results were all right, but nothing too great. I did do a bit of wet blending of the pantina on the base of the stems, so it would gradually get darker the farther away it went from the glowing center. To make the caps look like they're glowing, I painted the perimeter with spa blue, and then using water, wet blended it towards the center. My camera had a hard time picking this up, but again, Wylock has a great video showing how to do this. I also did the wet blending at the top of the stem. I felt these needed a bit more visual interest, so I went in with these bioluminescent veins. To make these, I just painted thick lines with Pantina, and then at the center I applied Spa Blue. And that's it for the Enoki inspired mushrooms. I wasn't entirely satisfied with the paint job of these, but again, game time's coming up, so I wanted to get these done. I might come back and revisit them later. And there you have it, my finished modular fungal forest. This project was a step forward in my crafting career. While it didn't turn out exactly how I had hoped, it did teach me a lot. During this project, I stepped out of my comfort zone and experimented with a lot of new ideas. Yes, there were partial failures, but failure is how we progress as creators. And that's the main takeaway of this project. Go beyond your comfort zone, and don't be afraid to fail. While this concludes the Fungal Forest series, I may revisit the Underdark for future builds and add some more fungal shapes as bonus episodes. And as always, if you got something from this video, please hit that like button, and if you haven't already, subscribe. There are more videos on the way, and they will be released more frequently from this point on.
But until the next video, thanks for watching and keep on crafting.